The Candid Frame is supported by donations by listeners just like you. Help us to bring you great conversations with great photographers. Support the show today with your monthly contribution through our Patreon effort at patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. Thank you. This episode of The Candid Frame is brought to you by Squarespace. Start building your website today using squarespace.com. Use the promo code CANDIDFRAME at checkout to get 10% off. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. This is Ibadi and X, and this is The Candid Frame. Though the year that was 2016 may not have been the best in many ways, we like to think that when it comes to the candid frame, it's been a pretty good season. Not only did we celebrate 10 years of interviews, but we think we were able to share some stellar conversations with you over the past 12 months. Our audience is growing and we've received generous support from many listeners just like you who are helping to improve TCF. But to end the year, we are pleased to share our conversation with photographer Stacy Pearsall, a photographer and military veteran who was honored with the Bronze Star Medal for her service. After an injury suffered in combat ended her career in the military, she continued as a photographer. Her veterans portrait project has taken her throughout the country, making beautiful portraits of veterans from different wars and conflicts. It's an inspiring project that honors the very best among us. Well, Stacey, welcome to The Candid Frame. It's a real pleasure to, to have a chance to sit down and talk with you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, you joined the service when you were 17 years old, and you, you had a history of family that had been in various various armed services. At 17, what did you think you knew going in about serving? <laughs> well, I think at 17, one, one believes they know everything there is to know about the world. I think that's just every typical full-hearted young teenager. So in terms of military service, all I really had to go off was my family. My dad served my grandfathers, my uncles, and my aunt. So, you know, it was always something that was um, in the forefront of my mind. And it just seemed like a natural progression of things people look at going from elementary school to high school to college. For me, it was elementary school, high school, military. And when you signed up, how did you get involved in, in learning f- photography? Because you went through your, you know, your basic training, but how did that transition into you being able to practice and learn photography? Well, uh, when I enlisted, I asked for a, a job in the arts, and my uncle, who was um, stationed in San Antonio in the Air Force, uh, was was the guy who was working assignments for newcomers into the Air Force. So I talked to him about what jobs were offered, and he said you could be a graphics designer, you could be a, a photographer, or you could be a videographer. And again, being young, I just said, I'll take whichever opens up first, and photography happened to be it. So... When I uh, went to basic training, as soon as I completed that portion, they sent me off to Fort Meade, where all of the branches of service send their basic still photographers to be trained at the Defense Information School. And those first initial years of your your training and your practice of photography weren't necessarily the most glamorous, right? You (laughs) You were doing a lot of film processing? Yeah. So I came in in the late 90s. And it was a time when they were um, downsizing the military and combining a lot of jobs. And so they took basic still photographers and combined them with folks who were working on the U2 program, which for some may not know what that program is. But through the Cold War, they used the U2 plane to um, document reconnaissance footage. And it was a five and a half inch wide roll film on 500 foot rolls. And it was IR sensitive and somebody had to process all that film that came off the planes. And I got trained and as a basic still photographer. I had a follow-on course as someone who could process that film. And my first assignment out of the gate was in the YouTube program. So I did that for four years, which was not fun. I mean, it had its perks. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to sound like it was terrible because it was a great time. It was just not what I had intended. I wanted a camera in my hands. What was involved in, in going from doing that to getting 
into the combat camera. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of very sore knees and begging. <laughs> because I assure you, everyone wants to be a combat camera, especially at the time when I was applying. And there were only 50 positions at the first combat camera squadron, which was the first and only in the Air Force. And everybody was vying for it. And trust me, there were photographers out there who were much more experienced, had a heck of a lot more talent, just, you know, much more efficient and proficient behind the camera. I guess what I had going for me was the person who was the superintendent at the first combat camera for the basic still photography side was my super te- superintendent at my YouTube base uh, at my first assignment. So he knew that I worked really hard and that I was still photographing on my own time outside of the lab and that I would I would pretty much bleed and die before I before I gave up trying. And so I got the position reported to Charleston, South Carolina. And wasn't it sort of an expectation that you would be willing to re enlist? Was that part of the part of the deal? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, to even qualify for combat camera at the time, the specifications were that you had to have at least four years of military service, that you had retainability, which means that if you didn't have another four years ready to commit to that particular unit, then you needed to re-enlist for another four years. You had to have exemplary performance reports. So that means uh, excelling at your work, excelling at physical fitness, and also making making sure you're advancing constantly with what we call skills training. And, and what was your what was your understanding of of the job? Because people hear the word combat camera and they're thinking that you're just in firefights all the time. But be, before you went out and you actually started living that life, what what was your image of what that work would in, and involve? Did you have a real clear idea of it or did you just have sort of a, a semblance of an understanding? Sure. Well, remember, I came in the late 90s. So we were at, at a time of peace and combat camera was going all across the world where the Department of Defense had representation. And that includes humanitarian relief, um, like drilling wells in Africa, or, you know, if, if there was an earthquake, say like, or, or even like the tsunami uh, that happened in Thailand, they responded there. The uh, hurricane that happened right here in, in the United States down in Louisiana, we reported to that. So there's a lot more than just the conflict aspect of combat camera. It is the documentation of U.S. armed forces across the globe doing any action that you can imagine. So w- when you m- made the transition and you started documenting those those things, how was that different from all the training that you had received today? What did you learn in the field that you couldn't possibly have learned in the classroom? There are a lot of things that you can't uh, experience from a, from a classroom. And, and by that, I mean, there are dynamics at play when you are actually in the field that one can't teach you. And it it is completely up to each individual photographer as well. The, for me, I went to Syracuse, the military photojournalism program at Syracuse. And of course, ethics was always very big. And I'm a, you know, member of the National Press Photographers Association and, and, uh, you know, adhere to their ethical standards. And trust me, ethics is huge. It's paramount. And you can see it on paper, but until you're in the field and and you're actually putting these um, theories into practice, one can't really teach you how you're going to mold that into your everyday. Could you give me an example of uh, when that was actually the case for you? Well, one one of the harder situations I found myself in was as a combat photographer in the military, I had the role of you know covering everything every aspect of, of combat and that includes unfortunately covering soldiers who were wounded or killed in action it's really tough to do that when you you live and you eat and you work with these guys every single day and it's it's it, i wouldn't be lying if i said i what didn't become friends with them because i spent so much time and one particular day a friend of mine was shot and I had a very hard ethical and moral struggle about what to do and how to proceed at that point, whether to take pictures or not to take pictures. And these are the kind of situations that one may find themselves in that I don't have the answers for because it's really up to the individual. Mm. When was your first uh, uh, tour of of, of Iraq? When, When did that happen? That was in June of 2003. And again, uh, in September, October 2003. So it was kind of split up. 
Okay. So when you first got there, I mean, it was, you, you likely could not have sort of anticipated what you were going to encounter, uh, even with all your training and all the experience that you, you had. What were those first months like? How, how did you have to adjust to, you know, not only being in a different country during wartime, but having the responsibility of, of making photographs and telling a, telling a story? Well, as a 23-year-old, it was an uh, eye-opening experience, and I thought I had seen a lot of the world since I had been traveling with combat camera already, but nothing compares to um, the austere conditions that of, of war on the front line. Now, in 2003, I would arguably say, in all my experiences in combat, that was probably the mildest of all my deployments. Uh, it was still, it still had its moments, you know, gunfire and you know, the kind of hair raises the hair on your neck, but it was a, a good transition into uh, much more heavier fighting that was to come later in my career. Was that the time to, uh, of your first injury? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you could tell us yeah. about what happened. Well, I had been covering um, the rebuilding of the school that Saddam's wife taught elementary previous to the shock and awe campaign. And as a result of that particular bombing campaign, the school had been hit really hard because uh, it was being used by Ba'ath Party supporters. The initiative to rebuild the school was um, paramount in order to, I guess, win the hearts and minds of the local people. So one of my jobs was to go out there like every week, every two weeks and kind of photograph the progress and talk to the locals and see how everything was going. So fast forward to like near the end, I think I had maybe two weeks left in country. And the school was, it was a grand opening and they invited Dateline NBC and a whole bunch of other local media. And they had terrible cake and the kids were laughing and it was a great day. So as luck would have it, and these are always things that you can't, that are out of your control. But my videographer partner was assigned to the open seat in the rear of the convoy. And I was assigned to the vehicle in the front with the colonel. And I was kind of jumping for joy because uh, my vehicle was the less likely to be hit by an improvised explosive device. What I had forgot on that particular day was when we pulled down that road, it was a dead end and it was a very narrow street. So when we got done doing the grand opening, all of us loaded up into the trucks and we had to do like a, an Austin Powers 50 point turn to get out of the, the road. And all of a sudden my vehicle was in the rear. Uh, and that's when the bomb went off. So uh, we had found out much later that um, from the very beginning, before demolition even began on the school, the IED was, was there. And as they began to rebuild it, they took all of the infrastructure and laid it on top of the bomb. So oh, it, wow. became, <laughs> it became like shrapnel. But um, so I had a neck injury and a head trauma. But like many people at that time, I just kept working. Yeah, it took a while for you to realize that you were suffering from PTSD. Well, that's a whole nother ball of wax, but yes. So how, how, so how is that a different ball of wax? Because I thought they were uh, related to that first incident, at least the, the first occurrences of your inability to get sleep and your irritability and, and, and so on. Or was that directly related to the to the brain trauma? Well, some I, I can't really talk about the medical aspect of the relation between traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. There's some people that link those two, but I, I look at the, the cumulative experience in, in Iraq as to what was the catalyst of, of the traumatic, uh, post-traumatic stress. My brain trauma and my neck were definitely that, that particular moment in time. So the IED was just sort of the, the, last, the last straw on everything that was building up from that experience. So when you returned for your, uh, for your other deployments, how did you because it, it got progressively worse, uh, the combat situations that you were put into. So how did you start having, how did you have to adjust to the, the increasing volatility of, of what was happening there and your responsibilities to use the camera in order to be able to document what was happening? I, I know this is going to sound really um, strange to say it, but when we drive to work every day to the office or we have somewhere we go routinely, whether that's the grocery store or the hardware store, we get in our cars and we go there and we don't really think twice about the turns and the corners that, that we make to get to that point. We've just done it so much and maybe not really consciously aware of how we got from point A to point B. As a combat photographer and as I, as I gained more experience, it became much like that. 
in that I could tune out the gunfire and and the chaos that that one finds themselves in when documenting conflicts like that in order to better focus on my job, literally and figuratively. I think the other upside about being a photographer is that you're only you're seeing as wide as your your lenses focal length so for me that's quite narrow and uh it can act as a sort of shield in many ways did you find that the, the more difficult times weren't the moments you were actually in combat but in the in the downtime the in-between times yeah i think what what can be really really tough is, is that sort of a time of reflection and as a photographer, I never stopped working. So while the fellas were, you know, trying to get some sleep or standing watch and things like that, I was I was still photographing and and <laughs> still photographing, still standing watch. So my mind never shut off. And what I never anticipated was becoming a sounding board for some of the soldiers and finding myself kind of like um, like <sighs> a. a a way to vent like and and to get an outsider's perspective because these guys have trained with each other and and have worked with each other and maybe not want to talk about those sort of intimate things that you're not supposed to talk about when you're mm -hmm. downrange and I would not judge them and they had no fear of reprisal when they talked to me so my time was very much occupied and last but not the very least is that I was by my last deployment, married, and my husband was also deployed at the same time. So there was also that in the periphery and, and worried about him, making sure that he was going to come home okay. How far were you guys um, uh, away from each other physically during during that time you were both deployed? Yeah, it was a helicopter ride, at least. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how did you guys sort of just keep in touch? Was it sort of a daily thing? Was that an important part of you sort of sort of maintaining your, your, your sanity and your focus while you were there? Well, to the, toward the last deployment, we got in the habit of sending cards to each other because we could do that for free, free post within the country. Mm -hmm. So we'd get, we'd get the most horrific 99 cent cards <laughs> <laughs> and send them to each other. And, you know, that our post would never stop. But for phone calls and internet, we would be in blackout conditions if somebody was killed. So in my, in my case, my base was always <laughs> blacked out. So on the rare occasion, we would email each other um, and send each other selfies and, and, and keep up to date that way. But cards, physical letters were the most important. One of the things that you did is that you took a lot of portraits of these soldiers. And for many of them, uh, that was the last portrait that was made of them. Mm -hmm. And I know that you were very conscious of, of that fact. And that was one of the reasons that sort of pushed you to, you know, be making these portraits of, of, of these men and, and these women that were going out and possibly not, not coming back. Was the practicalness of that something that sort of, like you said, you kept focused on doing your work. The reality of that, to me, feels incredibly sort of painful and just creates an ache in my chest to think about it. But did you find that that ache, by looking at it in terms of this is what I'm doing my job that I'm trying to be of service, sort of take the edge off of that as much as it can? I think, it. I don't know, and nothing ever took the edge off, I can assure you. I, I always felt like it was a sense of duty and a, 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 a privilege. I, I don't know if that sounds weird or not, but... When I when my first friend got killed and I had pictures that I could give their family that made me feel a lot better than than of those soldiers whom I didn't have pictures of and I made a vow to myself at that point that I wouldn't let that happen um, if if at all humanly possible so I did my best to take portraits of every soldier before we went out on patrol or on operation just in case the worst could happen mm -hmm. you know. And I guess that still carries with me today. People often ask me, like, "Hey, what's your what's the favorite your most favorite picture you've ever taken in your career?" And I was like, "Well, it's probably one you'll never see and never never know of, because they weren't for everyone; they were for the families." Tell me about the the photographs of 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 the soldiers when they weren't in combat, because uh, mm -hmm. that that was probably the bulk of the imagery that you you made, where they were at the camp or when they were just socializing. Tell us about telling the story of, of, of their lives with those photographs. For me, it was so much more important to remind people 
that soldiers are human beings. They are brothers, sisters, husbands, and wives. And simply because they wear a uniform does not make them immortal. And I wanted to make sure that I continued to humanize the war experience. I believe that it's easy to become uh, jaded to it. And if you are inundated with it day in and day out, then it just becomes this this thing where it's just some people in uniform and, oh, so-and-so got killed today. It's just another statistic. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that these people weren't looked upon as statistics. I wanted them to have identities and emotions. And that is the other thing that I felt like a lot of the combat photography I was seeing was, was lacking in some way, was that emotional connection between individuals that, you know what, I don't know if it was me or, um, or the guys or my relationship and having spent so much time with them and our camaraderie, but they would be a lot more intimate with each other in front of me than I, than I'd see in front of other people. So that allowed me the opportunity to get that occasional hug or, um, sort of emotional exchange that I didn't often see elsewhere. Did you have much interaction with um, other photographers who weren't necessarily in the service, but who may have been in, in, embedded what was, oh, yeah. tell me about your interactions and your relationships with them because they're working for wire surfaces or newspapers mm -hmm. or magazines, mm -hmm. but you're, you know, you have, you're working for the, for the military with much mm -hmm. different priorities. How, how was the interaction and relationship with them? And, and can you tell me a bit about when you guys may have sort of helped each other in terms of each of you trying to do your, your work? I can tell you I was absolutely starstruck when I met Yuri Kozarev <laughs> downrange. He came out to Fab War Horse at the height of the battle for Bakuba. And I absolutely adore him as an individual and admire his, his work. I think he is a prolific photographer. And um, I really am truly humbled to have had so much time just one on one with him. And we, you know, we would sit in it over coffee, and we would just talk and not necessarily about photography, but of those, those, I can't stress this enough, but bringing things back to reality, it is easy to be swept up into this alternative universe or alternate universe called war. And just sitting there and talking with your Yuri about things back home and uh, and about work off the battlefield, it was a real touchstone for me. I also met uh, Eros Hoagland, and he's known for his work most currently in South or excuse, Central America and Mexico, Colombia particularly, I believe. Really nice fella. And my experiences with the wire services were, were wholly positive. I had heard from soldiers who had less than favorable experiences, but myself as a photographer and and getting to work with them or to even sit and chat with them was always positive. And Bakubo is where you, you were last injured? Yes. Tell us about what happened that, that day. Um, well, it was a series of events over the course of that particular deployment. My, my neck hadn't really healed properly from the first time it was hurt, and I got hit by another roadside bomb in 2007. And then I kept working and kept working. I was wearing about 60 to 80 pounds worth of body armor and professional equipment. And that wore down my neck even after that injury. So finally, it was a real hell of a firefight one night. And I went out to grab a soldier who had been hit by an RPG. And I got taken off my feet. And that's that. That's how my career ended. What was... What was the hardest part about realizing that you weren't going to be able to go back and do something that you found so much meaning in? I believe that one of the hardest parts was, you know, since I was 17, I had all I had ever known was military service and um, moreover, being a, a photographer. And I loved being a combat photographer and faced with a future without that was pretty gray. It was quite an adjustment period, <laughs> a long adjustment period. What, what what was it about it that you that you love so much? Because it's you know you're you're documenting some of the worst things can that anyone can ever witness, and to some people that would sound very strange. But mm -hmm. tell me why is it that you had such a passion for it, and why you were so sad that you couldn't return to it? My passion really came from the idea that my photography could bring about change, so that we didn't have to face these horrors anymore. It wasn't about being in it or being part of it. 
my the idea of hoping that I could have an impact on humanity and how we view conflict in a way that would keep us from bearing arms in the future against other human beings. I, it's conflicting in, in that, yes, I was considered a combatant. I was a combat photographer in the military. But I, seeing con- how conflict impacts both sides, there are no winners. Because both sides believe that they are uh, fighting for something that's, that's worthy. And who am I to say that that's not right? But what I'm saying is that as a photographer, I can document, I can document what is happening between these two sides and say, is the outcome going to be good on either side? Probably not. And I hope that we can find a different way to resolve these differences aside from, you know, killing one another. I guess, too, as as a combat photographer, it was important for me to show the people who were caught in the middle. And as a woman, seeing how it impacted the women of Iraq and the children and so on, That, to me, was important to make sure that they weren't forgotten in this story. Hopefully 2016 has been a great year for you photographically. Looking over the images that you've produced over the past 12 months, you've been able to capture images that represent your growth and your development as a photographer. Now the question is, where do you want to go from there? Hopefully you want to share your photographs and show them off in the, in the best way possible. And some of you may actually want to create more opportunities for yourself as a photographer earning income, either part-time or full-time. But whatever the case, to do that, you have to find a way to showcase your images and yourself at their best. Squarespace allows you to do that. It's easy to do with their customizable templates that offer drag and drop simplicity. You can upload and display your images with any variety of designs and formats, but the best part is that you can customize it to your taste and style. You don't have to worry about looking like everyone else. You can make it your own and it can all be done in a matter of hours. Take it for a spin today. Start your free trial with no credit card required. Visit squarespace.com and when you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code CANDIDFRAME to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. I'm sure that you dealt with some probably some severe depression when you when you realized that you weren't going to be able to continue doing the work. Um, tell us about that, that period of time and how were you able to pull yourself out of the depths of, of what I imagine was a deep depression? Um, well, I was dealing with a lot of things all at once. So I was trying to recover physically and um, I was trying really hard to hold on to my military career, but that was falling apart very, very quickly as well. And I think the underlying current was unaddressed uh, mental health issues. And and that had to do a lot with the climate of photojournalists uh, altogether really don't talk a lot about their feelings about <laughs> things because we're not meant to interject our own emotions into situations. Um, so that's one par for the course in this particular career. It's even more amplified within the military community. That's just something you don't talk about is emotions. So I wasn't ready to address those things and, until I hit rock bottom. And that's when I, I wasn't sleeping and um, I was, you know, considering suicide. It did not come easy to recognize that within myself. And I really attribute making a comeback to my husband's continued support and um, finding a new purpose, which was the Veterans Portrait Project. One of the things that uh, I've heard you talk about was was when you were trying to get help through the, the VA that you faced, you know, some challenges there that, that made you aware of sort of the fight that a lot of veterans have at home. Um, tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, I think, you know, really the difficulty of getting health or mental health care really started when I was still in the service. And that went all the way back to uh, 2004 when I first came came back and was struggling. And I was trying to seek care within the service <laughs> really quietly. I went to a mental health therapist on base and they were really only dealing with marriage counseling and stuff. I didn't feel that they were equipped to deal with what I was dealing with. So they did not treat me very well to begin with. So then I bailed on that and I uh, was 
recommended to reach out to the chaplain who made an appointment with me. And I, I showed up 10 minutes early and stayed 10 minutes after my appointment. He never showed. So that was kind of reflective of mental health care in the military at the time. It was a, a, a Vietnam veteran who uh, recommended I go to somebody in the vet center. And that's what I did for about a year uh, while I was still in the service. And the vet center never notified the military that I was doing it. It was something that was kept very confidential. And it was just what I needed. <laughs> And that, that gave me a, a really good foundation to continue to be able to work and to cope and have really good coping skills. I think what ultimately happened, uh, like in 2007, when I came back, what was really tough was 2007, the battle for Bakuba particularly was very, very intense. We had a lot of casualties that had a real high impact on me. And I wasn't able to put those good coping skills to use. And unfortunately, it was just layered upon layer upon layer. And when I came back and, and was going through re physical rehabilitation, I had pushed all of that stuff down and down and down, and that just festered. And finally, when my career was over, that was catastrophic. And that's ultimately um, when I decided to go back and get counseling at the VA, which was not really prepared for a woman of my age or woman, period. It was really difficult to be able to explain to the VA my own special needs when they didn't necessarily look at me as a combat vet. I had to com continue to fight over and over again and tell them that, hey, yeah, I'm a combat vet. I have combat experiences. I have PTSD. I'm dealing with it. I don't need to be put into a women's group. Not that I, mean, I know everybody has their struggles, but I'm not dealing with military sexual trauma or marriage counseling or anything like that. I have combat trauma. So um, it was really hard to be able to uh, articulate to them when I could hardly articulate to myself what I needed at the time. Um, I really wanted to help bring about change within that system so that so that there there wouldn't be a struggle like I was uh, facing all the time. So how did the Veterans Portrait Project um, come about and how did it, it sort of contribute to your own healing? Well, I spent a lot of time at the VA hospitals during my physical and mental rehabilitation. I was waiting for my neurology appointment one particular day, and it had been like two hours in the waiting room, which was really stupid, but normal. And I was feeling particularly raw um, and uh, surly and not, not approachable that day. I saw a guy staring at me in my peripheral vision, and I felt really frustrated. And I wanted to just turn it and yell at him, but... I didn't. I instead asked him if there was something I could do for him, and that was just the op the door opening that he was he was looking for to have a conversation. And we went on. We, he told me about his military career and how he went to the recruiter, recruiter didn't want him, and then all of a sudden D Day was about to happen, so they were meeting a whole lot more guys, and then he, so he went into the army, and he was at Normandy, and then he liberated concentration camp. In short, this guy was a national treasure, and I was going to treat him very, very poorly. <laughs> <sighs> but level heads prevailed, and I think that was just the window opening that I needed to find the segue in my life. And I, I thought in my mind that if I could sit here and not know this stranger was a hero, how many of them were among me, um, you know, amongst us. So I wanted to start taking portraits and archiving their stories. And it really started small. I had a couple of small flashes that I would bring to the hospital with me. And um, when I was waiting for my appointments, I had uh, the help of the public affairs officers there at the VA hospital taking portraits. And then instead of taking portraits while I was waiting for my appointments, I would just go there and take portraits. And that's how it started. And part of that was getting to know these people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How did that feel to have an opportunity to, you know, be face to face, not only photographing these people, but engaging them in, in, in ways that were probably very similar to what you had experienced when you had been back in, in Iraq? Well, quite frankly, I had to have experienced what I experienced in Iraq in order to better relate to the veterans I was talking to, because there are there are experiences that only other military members could have and, and to relate and even combat experience that, that one can speak that dialogue or to have a true understanding. So a war veteran is not necessarily going to talk to someone who's never experienced that in the same way as someone who has. And I believe that is what makes the Veterans Portrait Project so special. It is not only 
ar archiving these veterans' portraits for history, but it is allowing the veteran to open up on a level that they maybe not have had the opportunity to previously. Do you feel that even though you might not have discussed the details of what you or, or, or they had experienced, that, that somehow having that shared life experience provide, provided you as a photographer a, a, an ability to be able to connect to them and draw something out of them in, in terms of the portraits that you made? Absolutely. I think so. Can you give me, uh, tell me a story about one of the people that you sort of photographed early on that was, you know, that was, that was special or that it was particularly memorable for you? Well, I, it was probably my first year of the Veterans Portrait Project and I wanted to go out to this. It was a homeless veterans transition house where they were giving homeless veterans, getting homeless veterans off the street and housing them in old Navy base housing. And they would give them occupational therapy um, if they needed, you know, either drug or alcohol rehabilitation. That would be part of the process. Anyway, it was an extraordinary um, program. And I wanted to get out there and, and set up my little studio and do portraits. And I did. <laughs> so one day I was set up underneath this carport taking pictures. And it was there was a, a gentleman who was in the program. And he was kind of lingering on the outskirts of all the, the guys who were getting their portraits taken. The, the gentleman from the VA who was there, my handler, so to speak, told me that he, this, this particular veteran was having a very hard time and that he had not spoken in months, that he was a mute in all different directions, uh, unshaven. And the, the clothes he was wearing looked like he'd been wearing them for months. I had wrapped up on what I thought was my last portrait and there I think one of the most important things we as human beings have is the ability to communicate without words. And I looked at the gentleman and he looked at me and we didn't have to say anything to each other. I think, I think he saw what I had experienced in my own eyes and my own body language and my own gesture. And I could see that reflected in his eyes. And I, I knew then that there was going to be something special and we connected and I just gestured for him to come into the studio. And uh, we didn't say anything to each other. We said a lot in, in the unspoken things that happened between us. And we probably spent 15 minutes together. And when, when we were done, he gave me a big hug and said, thank you. Like verbally said, thank you. And so that really weighed on my heart and still does. It, it has mm. been one of the most rewarding parts of this particular project that still stays with me and, and keeps me going why I do it. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, you said it started off relatively small, but it's come bigger and bigger over the years. <laughs> Tell me about how this whole thing has sort of, sort of grown and maybe in ways that you couldn't even, couldn't have even uh, imagined. Well, it was always in Charleston and then somebody Somebody in Savannah was like, hey, come down to the Savannah Clinic and do your thing. And I was like, okay, cool. So I went down to Savannah. And, you know, I, I set a goal that I wanted to photograph veterans in every state from which the military recruits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Excuse me, every state and province, including Puerto Rico and Guam. So, of course, getting down to Savannah was good. And then I went to um, Raleigh, North Carolina, and... Um, so whenever I had the opportunity, if I was traveling for work, I would be like, hey, let me take some portraits of some veterans while I'm here. And uh, and then some folks were like, hey, would you mind coming and, and taking some port portraits? We're doing this event. And I'm like, sweet, that'd be great. So it started, started picking up a little momentum. But what really drove the project forward was coincidental. And again, this is, <laughs> I don't know. I've been so lucky in my life. I was having some portraits at this fundraiser exhibition outside of New York City. And a gentleman financier there from, from the Wall Street District um, was chatting with me, and I was talking to him about the project and this little small little thing I had going uh, and what I wanted to do. And he's like, oh, this is great. You'll be hearing from me. And I was like, okay, I have no idea what that means. or who he, I had no idea who he was. So a couple weeks passed, and I had completely forgot, and I get a call from this guy named Keener Gill at USAA. USAA happens to be an insurance and banking firm for military veterans and their family. Mm. It's, it's huge. Um, you've probably seen their commercials. So Keener goes, hey, I'm going to be in Tampa. You should fly down, and, and we should talk. 
And I was like, why, <laughs> why? But um, I was like, okay, yes, I'm, I'll come. So I, I flew down to Tampa and I gave a presentation about my job as a combat photographer and all, you know, all the things that had transpired. And then I closed with the Veterans Portrait Project. And I said, you know, this is all fine and dandy, but this project really means a lot. And he's like, well, I think we might be able to help you get to some of the states that you, you have yet to do. We should start next year. That, so we were talking in 2012. So in 2013, I ended up doing 17 states. And then wow. in, in 2014, I did another 22. And in 2015, I did something like 30 30 cities. And then t this year I've done just as many. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So it all started with USAA and then a whole bunch of other people came on and said, Hey, we want you here. We want you here. We want you here. So it's been amazing. It, and it must have been an amazing sort of learning experience for you because, you know, people will talk, well, I've talked to a lot of people who've done personal projects and they may be for three months, six months, maybe a couple of years. You know, yours is pretty extensive. So I, I'm sure that you've learned a lot, not only in terms of your photography, but also about, you know, your fellow, your fellow veterans and yourself yeah. probably along the way. What, yeah. what, what are some of the things that you feel stand out in terms of what you've gained as a result of working on this project for so many years? I think what has been really important is the fact that human beings are very resilient, particularly the veteran community. And when I have days where I struggle, because one doesn't one doesn't get healed or fixed from post-traumatic stress, you just learn to live with it. So on the days where I'm having bad days, being part having the Veterans Portrait Project is a constant reminder that I can be resilient and that I can wake up another day and move forward. So that is first and foremost. I attribute being alive on this earth to two things, my husband and the project. As long as I have those in my, in my life, I, I am definitely fulfilled. Yeah. I think, and all the other things that I had no idea um, was military, the military history I've learned. I mean, there's stuff that, that you see on the History Channel or the Military Channel or the things that you learned in books. And then there's the experience of the people who actually lived it. And those, I mean, the stories that I've heard are unimaginable. And I feel honored that they would feel safe enough to share those with me. So it's been really a blessing. Yeah, I can imagine that in some respects, you've felt a, a connection to that legacy because of your family. But you sort of, with this series, created sort of an extended family for yourself mm -hmm. as a result of this. I think it's so fantastic. I could, I could go to any city and give a holler out and they'd be like, yeah, come have dinner or let's, let's get together. Or we, you know, it's, it's a family. Absolutely. And I would say in the military, we are considered brothers and sisters. The veteran community is no different. But, um, the project has definitely brought me so much more closer to that veteran community as well. What feedback or what responses have you gotten back from the veterans who have seen these photographs not not just their own but their brothers and sisters and their canine brothers and sisters mm -hmm. uh in this in the service what what have you heard from them as a result of this i'm always very humbled when i receive correspondence from veterans and i will get emails and actually handwritten notes and uh, phone calls they are often um I, sh I should say, for, first and foremost, veterans are the most humble community, and they always feel so undeserving of any attention or recognition. And when I say, hey, I would love to take your portrait and hear your story, they're like, oh, no, you should do somebody else. Mm -hmm. they're, they, they've done so much more than me. And these people may actually be like Medal of Honor recipients or um, Bronze Star awardees. Like, what? Anyway, um, I'm getting so off track. But my point is that when I do take their portrait and they tell me uh, I take terrible pictures or um, <laughs> nobody could ever capture me as I feel I am, and they, they write me and tell, and tell me that it's the best picture that they've ever had in their whole life and their family adores it, then that is what really means the most to me. Because that's the whole reason. I want them to realize that, especially the Vietnam veterans, that I appreciate their service, that I am so thankful to have them in my life. And I just want to say, I want to tell them how much I appreciate them. And by giving them a portrait that they actually absolutely adore and love, that is just, that's the bee's knees to me. 
So what, what lies ahead for the project? Uh, have you gone to Gu Guam and Puerto Rico yet? Has it been part of your itinerary or is that something that's uh, in the future? Um, no, I haven't done it yet. So all you people out there in Guam and Puerto Rico, I am coming at you at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do Hawaii and Alaska. I've actually got 23 states left. So I'm working on trying to get those completed in the next two years. It's ambitious, but I would like to. Well, considering how far you've come already. Yeah. <laughs> from a little chance of meeting in, in, a, in a waiting room to this, it's, it's quite amazing. Thank you. I thank you. But I have to tell you, I didn't do it all on my own. It took a lot of people behind the scenes um, rooting for me in the project and um, really supporting me. So I can't say that I, I did this all by myself. It Just like raising a child. <laughs> The project has taken a village to raise it, yeah. to raise it up. So, and that's what it's going to take to get the rest of the states completed and people rallying behind um, and supporting the project. Um, you know, if it doesn't happen in two years, that's fine. I've got a lifetime to finish it. This, this project is going to be one that's never ending because it's what it's it's fuel for my soul, and and I need that in my life. So it'll keep going. I hope to do a book at some point. <laughs> once once I get the states done, then I will then I will turn my eyes to doing a book. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone. Someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Well, when I was first arriving into combat camera, I had assigned many mentors many that you'd recognize. And one of them was Mary Calvert. She was working for the Washington Post in Washington, D.C., an amazing photojournalist, still is today. And she's working on a project about homeless female veterans. It has touched uh, many lives and I think is, is changing people's perspectives. So if you've not seen or heard of Mary Calvert, Please do, and if you don't, if you do know Mary Calvert, make sure you're checking out that project about homeless female veterans. It's it's really eye opening. Well, Stacy, thank you so much for for joining us. It was well a real pleasure and a real honor to to have a chance to talk with you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thanks again to Stacy Pearsall for joining us here at TCF. You can check out her work by visiting stacypearsall.com. Remember that you can and do play a big role in introducing others to the work that we do here at TCF. Take the time today, if you haven't already, to write a review in the iTunes store. You can also support the show by making a regular monthly contribution through Patreon. You can contribute amounts of $2, $5, $10 or more, or anything in between on a monthly basis and help make a big difference to the work that we do here at TCF. Even a donation of $2 a month, which breaks down to about 50 cents an episode, makes a big difference. Please support the show today. Thanks to Chris Jaffe for his donation to the show. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candor Frame app available for Apple iOS, Android, and Windows. Links for each can be found in the show notes and the website at The Candid Frame. The Candid Frame audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. Our senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.